Hey, it's Gary Turchin. How are you? Your poet laureate of his own laureate. Back to be his laureate ship. And I've got some new work I'm excited about, really, really excited about. I wrote all this and most of this in the last month. And so I'm just going to do a bunch of new poems for you. Gary Turchin, talk to you soon. The first one is called Prayer Poem. It goes like this. Writing a poem is like offering a prayer to a God that did not exist until the poem praised it. I'm going to say that again. Prayer poem. Writing a poem is like offering a prayer to a God that did not exist until the poem praised it. The next one's about writing poems, too. It's called Plea Bargain. I've been writing a lot of poems about poems. I don't know why. Plea Bargain. This poem is my plea bargain. The sentence is life at hard labor, handcuffed by words that can never do justice to the innocence lost. I'm going to do that again, too. Listen to it. Plea bargain. This poem is my plea bargain. The sentence is life at hard labor, handcuffed by words that can never do justice to the innocents lost. Yeah. Yeah, there's something to think about. Hey, it's me, and I'm butting in on my own show because I like that poem enough, and I really think I'd like to explain it better. See, plea bargain. This poem is my plea bargain. I, the poet, am making a deal. The sentence, I'm sentencing myself, double entendre the sentence, is life at hard labor. This is really hard labor. If it looks easy, you don't know what you're looking at. Life at hard labor, handcuffed by words, the very medium the tool that we use, that we mold into what we're expressing, handcuffs us. That's so why we need similes and metaphors and images to evoke beyond the words. Words are so limiting. Handcuffed by words that can never do justice. That word justice to the innocence lost. We as artists, as poets, as writers, we're trying to evoke that Garden of Eden innocence that's in our humanity. That, that we evoke out, we want to express through our art. But words are inadequate. We're handcuffed by words. This poem is my plea bargain. The sentence is life at hard labor, handcuffed by words that can never do justice to the innocence lost. Thanks for letting me butt in on my own show. We'll now return to the regularly scheduled poetry. All right, let's do one more poem about writing poems. I just wrote this one like today, I think. It's called Best Worst. The worst poem I ever wrote is better than the best poem I never wrote. Best Worst. The worst poem I ever wrote is better than the best poem I never wrote. Yeah, think about that one, huh? You think about that one while I find another poem for us to do. I'm excited about this poem. This is a, this is kind of a little bit of an epic. Uh, it's called Burning for Roses. Burning for Roses. And it's for Phyllis. Alongside my patio chair, inherited from an old friend, are roses the color of fire. I sit by them often, warmed by their blaze and beauty, and note how the flames break out like little buds, licks of golden yellow and burnt orange, trimmed with a blood-red embroidery that retreats, ghost-like, as the roses open wider and wider and invite the sun into their confidence. It's as if the reveal of these, shall we call them, secrets, stains the tender petals with blush, and within days the gold and orange blossoms, lit as they are like a candle, 
give way to the blood-red certainty of its embroidery, to become the red of a roaring fire, the red of a dark passion, the red of a red, red rose, so unghostlike, until the sea of silver, white, death, invades each bloom from its core, creeping up like a silent assailant, dousing the flames paddle by paddle, causing each to loose its grip and fall, as we all must one day fall, fall like perfect diamond secrets to the ground, where I, sitting like an old friend, a once and future ghost, gather them each by each into a scrapbook of words that can only hint at their fire, but can never, ever strike their match. Gather them each by each into a scrapbook of words that can only hint at their fire, but can never, ever strike their match. It was called Burning for Roses. Here's another new one. It's called Melons. I know more about cantaloupe than I do about love. Yet I so love cantaloupe. The irony does not escape me, nor does the melancholy. That's a personal one. Here's one. It's called A Nap-Winning Poem. A Nap-Winning Poem. I think I shall take a nap. There's nothing more poetic, poignant, purposeful, or Pulitzer Prize winning than a glorious afternoon nap. I accept. I accept. I do accept. And I really did run off and take a nap after I wrote that. I wrote it, and then I took a nap. In fact, it was just today. It real, no, it was yesterday. Oh, you know how the this day's called by my by. friend. It was yesterday. We all need a friend like this. I have a friend who holds me to things. My feet to the fire. My commitments. My word. He's a son of a bitch. That's it. <laughs> We love him. Trust me, we love him. He's just a hard friend. It's hard. It's a good friend, but a hard friend. Okay, a couple more. I want to do Meaning It and Quiet Afternoon. Let's start with Quiet Afternoon, because most of these poems are written in a quiet afternoon sitting in my backyard. And this poem is aptly called Quiet Afternoon. Birds sing my garden. Fill its quiet afternoon with chirp and chatter, woo-hoo and whistle, making chorus with the cry of distant sirens and the rumble of passing jets and the bark of dogs below me and above and the ever-constant drone of freeway whoosh and the clatter of keyboard strokes on my laptop as I write this and the drum of my own voice reading these words aloud. And I guess my quiet afternoon is not so quiet after all, but it is music to my ears and soul. And this is called Meaning It. I had a bright idea. I'd grow tomatoes. Not an original thought, but for me, these days, a breakthrough. Deborah gave me a tomato plant. I bought two more. Put them in pots on my patio. Patio pots. I like the sound of that. Patio pots. The sound was better than the tomatoes, which haven't grown a whit. Not a bright idea, I guess. Then again, anyone can grow tomatoes. Not anyone can write, patio pot, patio pot, patio pot, and mean it.
See, I am the poet laureate of my own laureate. I am. I've earned the right. I am the poet oh, laureate okay. of my laureate. This one is called Saging, or maybe just being sage. Um, it's about writing poetry again. It's a good one to end on. When I was a young poet, I would dawdle weeks, months, years over poems I'd conjured, marveling over their words, over my having chosen the words so well. Now that I am older, I have no time to adore any words at all, any poem, save this one, the one in front of me, but not even it, only this line of it, this word, no, this, 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 not even this, not even the ones that cut away the veil, no, no time to dawdle, as words burn their way through me like wildfire, to stop longer than to catch my breath would expose me to their runaway heat, melt me like a candle too close to any sun. Melt me like a candle too close to any sun. It's kind of how it is with me with poetry right now. Kind of a wildfire is broken out. And I uh, hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. I'm going to sign off for now. This is Gary Turchin, Poet Laureate of his own Laureate. I hope I've earned a little bit of Laureate from you. And keep, uh, keep checking in from time to time. There's going to be new work. I remain Poet Laureate of his own Laureate. Out. Till later. Gary Turchin.